Okay, so in this lecture, we will look at a generalization of the Parseval's theorem for Fourier integrals. So we saw how, you know, if you are able to write a function as a Fourier series, then you know this, the average of the square of the function, right, is is related to the sum of the squares of all these coefficients. Or if you are writing it in the exponential series, then it's the sum of the uh, square of the moduli of these the coefficients right so there is an extension of you know this theorem which is applicable also for Fourier transforms and that's going to be the content of this lecture and once again just like with Parseval's theorem with Fourier series this too you know has some very nice applications which follow from Parseval's theorem right so that's what's coming up in this lecture okay so in order to uh, you know, write down Parseval's theorem for Fourier integrals. You know, first we will work out a a generalized version of Parseval's theorem involving Fourier series for a periodic function itself. Right? So we saw how you know the product of a function with itself, and if you averaged over the of this quantity, was given in terms of the coefficient. So in fact, what you could do is consider two periodic functions f of x and g of x expand each of them which are both periodic with the same period let's say to pi in this case and f of x can be expanded in a Fourier series g of x is expanded in another Fourier series so you have all these coefficients a, a n and b n for the first function and a n prime and b n prime for the second function so then instead of considering the average of f of x squared or the average of g of x squared you can also consider the average of f of x times g of x. So if you do this, right, so you can show that in fact this average value 1 over 2 pi integral minus pi to pi f of x g of x dx is given by 1 over 4 a naught a naught prime, right, so only the diagonal terms so to speak will remain, right, so a n will go with a n prime and then you get this customary factor of half and likewise bn will go with bn prime of an overall factor of half outside and there is a summation involved over all n both for the these an terms and for the bn terms right it's not hard to you know show this result right and i urge you to convince yourself that this works out so the key idea is of course that you know these functions are orthogonal to each other right so they are members of this basis which is an orthogonal basis we have seen this and so if you take any cosine nx and multiply it with some other cosine of mx as long as n and m are not the same you know the average value of this product is going to go to zero but on the other hand if it is if n and m are the same then you get you know just one in the, uh, um, well you get a half right so it's the average value of cos squared in a period so you get a half so these are orthogonal but not not normalized so for it's since simply because it's straightforward to work out you know this integral of a of any of these basis elements with itself the inner product of any element with itself is straightforward to work out and likewise also with sine squared of nx you're going to get half but sine nx times sine mx you know the average value is zero right so this is an immediate consequence of the same result we used to prove Parseval's theorem you know involving just a single function now it turns out that this result in fact generalizes to Fourier integrals right so let's say you have f of f1 of x and f2 of x are two p functions non periodic functions and you find their Fourier transforms and let's say they are g1 of alpha and g2 of alpha so we have g1 of alpha is 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to plus infinity f1 of x e to the minus i alpha x dx and likewise you have another expression for g2 of alpha right so if you take the complex conjugate of the first of the above equations right so the generalization of you know this uh, result for Fourier series you know one has to be a little more uh, careful and introduce would, uh, has to work with complex conjugates of one of these functions right so like we discussed when we were doing linear algebra if you have a real field then so no, in the inner product of these kinds of vectors you can just think of them as the integral minus pi to pi f of x g of x 
dx for example but if you have if you allow for you know uh, these functions to be complex then the bra vector is going to have to uh, 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 you know there is there is a complex conjugation associated with with going to the bra vector so the inner product is going to be not just uh, you know f of x times g of x uh, uh, or I mean uh, in terms of alpha so you will have to make one of these you have to take the complex conjugate of one of these functions right so f1 star of x and f2 f of x will come in and f g1 star of alpha and g2 of alpha will come in as we will we will work out in detail so so let's say you start with these definitions you have g1 of alpha and g2 of alpha now you take the complex conjugate of the first of these equations so you have g1 star of alpha is equal to 1 over 2 pi minus infinity to plus infinity f1 star of x and then you have e to the i alpha x instead of e to the minus i alpha x dx of course nothing have it changes now now we multiply this g1 star of alpha with g2 of alpha and then integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity so so g1 star of alpha we already have this expression for g1 star of alpha so we plug this in and then g2 of alpha remains as it is d alpha as it is integral of course minus infinity to plus infinity so then we see that 1 over 2 pi you know this f1 star of x you know comes out so dx also comes out so you have dx f1 star of x integral minus infinity to plus infinity e to the i alpha x g2 of alpha d alpha so but so i have just you know rearranged these uh, you know various factors right so this this part doesn't care about you know this integral involving alpha so i i i am allowed to bring this stuff outside and then now i observe that in fact this integral is nothing but the inverse fourier transform of g2 of alpha but the inverse fourier transform of g2 of alpha is, is just f2 of x so this is equal to 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to plus infinity dx f1 star of x f2 of x so what we have managed to show is really an uh, an extension of the result for the Fourier series right involving two functions which were periodic but now if you have two functions f1 and f2 which are not periodic so if you do this integral minus infinity to plus infinity dx f1 star of x times f2 of x and then put in this factor 1 over 2 pi this is going to be the same as the integral minus infinity to plus infinity g1 star of alpha g2 of alpha d alpha so now if you now you say that you know these two functions are the same let's say f1 and f2 are the same and they're both equal to f then of course the fourier transforms also are going to be the same g1 equal to g2 equal to g then we have integral minus infinity to plus infinity mod of g of alpha squared d alpha is equal to 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to plus infinity mod of f of L x squared dx so which is basically the Parseval's theorem so this is the generalization of Parseval's theorem for Fourier integrals right so this factor you know is uh, is uh, is of course dependent on the manner in which you have defined your Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform but like I said before uh, you have the freedom to define your Fourier transform and then automatically it fixes the inverse Fourier transform for you right and it doesn't matter how you uh, you know you you share this factor between the Fourier and inverse Fourier transform as long as you are con con consistent throughout in your calculation okay so let's look at an example where we apply this um, this idea and so the we are going to work out the Fourier transform of the Gaussian function right so I have um, f of x is equal to exponential of e to the uh, exponential of minus x squared by 2 sigma squared right so uh, um, well I mean you have to read this carefully and understand that really I am referring to exponential of minus x squared by 2 uh, um, 2 sigma 2 sigma um, squared so if I do this maybe it will look better yeah I guess this is a bit better but uh, so the key point is that so this is what I am referring to it's an exponential over 
all of this stuff and likewise so this is going to appear later on as well. So if I want to find the Fourier transform of this function, so this is the Gaussian function, right? So you have seen what it looks like. It's, uh, it's peaked at the origin and then it tapers off and it falls off, you know, uh, very quickly on both sides and it's symmetric about the origin. So if you take the Fourier transform of this Gaussian function, you have 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to plus infinity, this function times e to the minus i alpha x dx. And so the way to proceed to evaluate this integral is to do what is called the completion of squares. So you have an exponential of minus x squared plus 2i uh, sigma squared alpha x divided by 2 alpha uh, squared. So this you can rewrite this as x plus i sigma uh, uh, sigma squared alpha uh, uh, the whole squared and then you have an extra constant part which has to be subtracted out and so if you take you, you know if you carry out this uh, exercise carefully so you will get an extra factor 1 over 2 pi you know is already there then you have an exponential of mi minus alpha squared sigma squared by 2 and then you have this integral which is actually just a standard Gaussian integral except that you know x seems to be shifted by some constant complex number right so you can make a change of variable x to x plus sigma squared i alpha right and then it's just this standard Gaussian integral right so one has to be a bit more careful and you know to to be completely correct and you know use the subtleties of you know complex uh, variables uh, However, so here we will just assume that it's all good and indeed it, it is true. So complex uh, variables are involved. So then you have to be a bit more careful. But so if we will assume that it's all good. And so indeed g of alpha is equal to sigma over square root of 2 pi e to the minus alpha squared sigma squared by 2. Right? So this part will just give you 1 over square root of 2 pi uh, sigma and um, um, right so, so so this part is going to give you a square root of 2 pi sigma and so sigma remains and then one of these square roots of 2 pi will will cancel and then you're just left with sigma over square root of 2 pi times e to the minus alpha squared sigma squared by 2. Now if we invoke so we have managed to find the Fourier transform and if we invoke Parseval's theorem right so into this relation so we immediately see that you get minus infinity to plus infinity sigma squared over 2 pi e to the minus alpha squared sigma squared d d alpha right so this is uh, um, you know integral of g of alpha mod of this squared and then you have to put in this factor 1 over 2 pi and that's followed by this integral minus infinity to plus infinity f of x the whole squared so that's going to become e to the minus x squared by sigma squared dx right so which is evidently true because you know you you just recast this in this form right instead of 1 over 2 pi you write it as 1 over square root of 2 pi on both sides and then you bring in one of these factors sigma to the other side so you have 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma here on the right right hand side and on the left hand side you write, rewrite this as 1 over square root of 2 pi 1 over sigma then exponential of minus alpha squared divided by 1 over sigma squared you know d alpha and then you see that both these integrals are really the same the left hand side and the right hand side and they're both equal to one right so they're both the standard gaussian integral and so in fact we get a result which is not a surprise right so in quantum mechanics you might have encountered uh, you know fourier transforms of this kind gaussian integral particularly is of very great importance so there the the physical interpretation is you know it has to do with you know wave function conservation right so it doesn't matter in which basis you expand your wave function right so if you sum over all the probabilities of it being in all possible uh, you know eigenvalues corresponding to that uh, operator then it has to add up to one right so that's one way of thinking about this if you're looking at it from the point of view of quantum mechanics but the result that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian and therefore the inverse Fourier transform of a Gaussian is also a Gaussian, right, is of great importance and it appears in all kinds of contexts including quantum mechanics. So that's all for this lecture. Thank you.